Well, um, of course, my topic today is on the modeling of the spatial and temporal variability of the winter soundscape in the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, because as if you've seen in the Anchorage paper that uh, my primary um, focus is on snow machine uh, time periods. Oops. The soundscape is uh, the biological, anth geophysical, and anthropogenic sounds that emanate throughout the, the landscape. In the emerging field of soundscape ecology, uh, we give these term we give terms to these components as biophony, geophony, and anthropophony. There are four main components of the um, of the soundscape, including acoustic composition or the frequency of sound measured in hertz, um, the amplitude of sound measured in decibels, and then there's the temporal variation, spatial variability and the acoustic interactions between biophony, geophony, and anthropony. Sound serves as an important component of an ecosystem. Um, it's a means of communication among individuals and between species. It can also help us identify where species are distributed and the occupancy of those areas. Although there's also a huge human component um, for those of us who enjoy the outdoors, and the natural sounds that they, uh, they emit. Um, <clears throat> there's also, um, however, the anthropogenic sounds can significantly change um, the, sounds, the natural soundscape, causing animals to uh, relocate to new areas, change their vocalization patterns, and, uh, or not vocalize at all. And this can also affect the human experience. The Kenai National Wildlife Refuge is a two million acre refuge located on the Kenai Peninsula. It manages 1.3 million acres of congressionally designated wilderness, um, but it manages these on conflicting mandates. Um, the Wilderness Act of 1964 requires that the refuge manage wilderness um, for w its wilderness character, including outstanding opportunities of solitude, um, which means the enjoying the outdoors in the absence of mechanized transports. Um, and then there's ANILCA, which um, requires that the refuge provide motorized access into wilderness areas, um, such as snow machines. So the, uh, this project um, was initiated on, um, based on these conflicting mandates for the need to study the soundscape as a means of um, as a means of uh, monitoring um, human disturbance. The refuge is far from pristine, uh, regardless of its uh, 1.3 million acres of wilderness. Um, it's located along the Sterling Highway, which cuts right through the refuge, um, which allows 1.4 million vehicles to pass through the refuge every year. There's a, it's also a major flyway for commercial airlines passing, coming to and from Anchorage, and uh, a great deal of non-commercial aircraft that uh, fly over the refuge on a daily basis. Surprisingly, there's also oil and gas compressor plants located in the northwestern portion of the refuge. Um, these emit constant sounds throughout the day and throughout the year, and more ephemeral um, more ephemeral sounds are uh, boating activities in the summertime and snow machining activities during winter. The potential of these um, anthropogenic sounds to affect the wilderness um, led me to these objectives. One was to determine the temporal variation of biophony and anthropophony, and two was to create a spatially explicit model identifying areas of anthropophony throughout the refuge. To sample the soundscape, I split the refuge into six um, regions. Um, <clears throat> there, I set out six sound stations um, at permanent locations to record the temporal variation. And uh, I used sound recorders such as the Larson Davis 831 and the uh, Wildlife Acoustics SM2. Both are um, high quality sound recording devices that can capture 
um, the sounds of the, the environment. And uh, to capture the spatial distribution, I set out six additional sound stations um, at temporary sites and moved them to new locations every two to three weeks. I, all in all, I sampled a total of 22 sound station locations throughout the refuge, and you can see the distribution of, of those sound stations um, throughout the winter of 2010-2011. Um, I recorded ambient sounds uh, for 20 seconds every 15 minutes. I collected over 63,000 sound files, um, totaling over 35, 35 gigabytes of information, and entered them into the Remote Environmental Assessment Laboratory's sound library, which is an automated system for calculating biophony and anthropony. Sound files are converted into spectrograms and separated into one kilohertz frequency bandwidths, or bins. Uh, it uses the Welch's 1968 algorithm for calculating power spectral density, which is simply the, uh, the degree of saturation of sound within a bin or the amount of energy emitted by a sound. So here's how a spectrogram is kind of broken down into uh, frequency bandwidths. You have uh, frequencies in kilohertz on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And then you have um, a calculated power spectral density for each, um, each bin. And this gives us a, uh, an idea of um, where, where most of the sound is occurring in, this spec in the spectrogram. So in this case, you see, I'll, it's better to show it over here, that uh, the four, the three to, f three to five kilohertz bandwidths have the most um, sound emission. So in order to calculate biophony and anthropony, um, based on preliminary data, we find that uh, most biological sounds occur at, kil at uh, kilohertz um, to above two kilohertz, sorry. Um, and so biophony is calculated as the, power spect the total power spectral density of all bandwidths before, above two kilohertz. Anthropony occurs more at uh, lower frequencies, and uh, so is the, uh, the one to two kilohertz um, bandwidth um, of the total power spectral density to, for uh, anthropony. Um, these are examples, these are two spectrogram examples of, uh, of a gray jay calling at uh, two kilohertz and above and an airplane um, flying over at uh, one to two kilohertz. I analyzed the temporal variation of uh, biophony and anthropony for my six permanent sound stations. And I'll give you examples of two of these sites um, for time's sake. And then I modeled the spatial distribution of anthropony from all 22 sound station locations. So here's, um, here's uh, some temporal results. Um, this is mile 126 uh, sound station, um, which is located in designated wilderness and is open to snow machines. Um, the area has relatively, if you pay attention to the uh, to the y-axis here, um, the uh, area has relatively higher amounts of uh, biophony compared to anthropony, um, and, but biophony increases during the time periods of March and April, whereas um, anthropony drops down between that time period. And this coincides with the snow machining season, which is from December to March. Paddle Lake is uh, another station that uh, is within designated wilderness, but is closed to snow machines. And interestingly enough, you see that biophony um, gradually increases over the months of January to, to March, um, coinciding with, uh, with the coming of spring and the melt of, of snow. Um, and, but uh, anthropony has a pretty interesting um, 
line here where it, it's lower in January and March and peaks in February. Um, and I found this due to uh, the increase of air traffic. So this is the first spatial model um, developed for anthropony on the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, by my knowledge, it's the only um, model of this, uh, of this type um, to date. Uh, we see that uh, there are higher anthropony values localized in the northern, northwestern part of the refuge. Um, and these are hot spots of uh, Soldatna um, in this area, Kenai, um, the oil and gas field and Swanson River area, and then the Sterling Highway and Mystery Creek Road, which is an area open to snow machines. When compared to uh, wilderness, we find that the northernmost wilderness units are uh, bordered and occupied by um, high anthropony values. Um, the central and southern wilderness uh, units are generally, have generally lower anthropony. To determine what the sound sources were contributing to the soundscape, um, I found, I listened to over 10,000 sound files with the help of some field techs. Um, it was long and tedious process, but we got through it. But we found that um, automobiles um, contributed a, a large amount to the anthropony values of the soundscape. Um, and in addition to that, we found aircraft also contributed, um, and to a lesser extent, um, snow machining. And uh, in some cases, we had people talking, but that's not mechanized transport. Um, and then the biophony values um, ranged from mostly uh, mostly um, bird species. So some of my preliminary conclusions, um, considering that uh, this is an ongoing study, uh, and this are basically results from my first field season um, of last winter, uh, we find that biophony values still dominate a majority of the refuge during the course of winter, um, although it is in the presence of anthropony, and uh, there could be implications there that uh, that bird species may perhaps be in, in, influenced by um, anthropony. Um, there's also anthropony is localized um, to certain areas of the refuge, like I said, and uh, this is intruding into uh, wilderness areas as well. Um, inaccessible areas of the refuge have lower amounts of anthropony, um, which is, of course, the southern region of the refuge. There's no roads out there. There's a few trails that you can get to, but in order to access it, it's, it's all fly-in. Um, the northern part of the refuge is uh, more accessible and, uh, of course, has more anthropony associated with it. Uh, vehicle traffic and air traffic um, in these areas um, can uh, affect the wildlife in the area as well as um, the outdoor experience of visitors in, in the accessible areas of the refuge. So the next steps um, for, uh, for uh, this coming winter um, is to increase my spatial sampling. Um, it's two million, the refuge is two million acres, so um, it's a large area to, uh, to cover. Um, but I, instead of having 12 sound, sound recorders, I now have 27. Um, so my, uh, my sampling design should be a little more robust. Uh, I'll set out 12 permanent stations to get a better temporal variation uh, throughout the refuge and uh, set out 15 additional um, sound stations to new, and rotate them to new locations every 10 days instead of two weeks. Because I found that two weeks was, um, was a little too long and, uh, and the values of anthropony and biophony kind of tapered off after 10 days. Um, I, I also want to identify quiet areas. After listening to over 10,000 sound files, you're listening to a lot of white noise. And um, so there's a lot of basically what we'd call silence out there. And uh, 
this is important for um, the human experience out in these remote locations. Um, and I'll do this by uh, parsing out the sound files um, with the absence of sound uh, from the, uh, the, their power, based on their power spectral density. Um, I'm also going to create uh, models of anthrophony as well as biophony um, based on the more robust design that I have. And then uh, build a time series models to show the temporal variation spatially, um, averaging over December, January, February, and March um, for, my, um, for my sampling uh, period. I'd like to thank John Morton of the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, uh, Paul Cuteman of uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, who's a modeling specialist, um, and Stuart Gage of Michigan State University, who is um, a soundscape ecologist and one of the most innovative um, individuals in this field um, who helped develop, who actually developed the, uh, the real sound library. I'd also like to thank Ryan Park, who probably listened to about 8,000 sound files um, and worked with me on the, on the refuge snow machining all over the place. Um, I'd also like to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for their funding and, uh, and the additional funding they're going to give me this year. Thank you.